tonight, I'd like to share with you my own personal journey through the global food supply. This is a, a 10-year project that, began by, that I began by photographing as assignments for various magazines, and more recently with my own money, as I try to finish what has become a somewhat obsessive project. I, I first became interested in food about nine years ago when National Geographic asked me to photograph a story about how we're going to meet the future food demands of humanity. The experts are saying that by the year 2050, we're going to have to double the world's food supply. Part of that um, issue is to cope with the rising population as we go from now about 7.8 to 10 billion. Um, but the bigger part of it is the, the changing diets of the, in the developing world, where people who have more money increasingly want more protein in their diet. Um, this is going to require a lot more food to feed all of those pigs, chickens, and ducks. And, um, I, I've been working as an assignment photographer at the Geographic for about 35 years, and my specialty is aerial photos. And starting in the late 90s, I did much of that with an unusual kind of aircraft called a motorized paraglider. Um, this, this photo was taken in Iran in, the, in a desert called the Dashti Lut, and I was flying a virtually identical aircraft to that. And um, it's the, this is the lightest and slowest motorized aircraft in the world. And it's basically a backpack motor with a parachute-style wing where you run to take off and land. Um, it, I can fly at about, it flies at about 30 miles an hour, and what's, it's, it's kind of like a flying lawn chair, and you have a unrestricted view, 180 degrees in horizontal and vertical dimensions. You only have to, you have to watch out for your knees when you get a wide angle lens. Um, and it, it let me visualize remote landscapes in a, in a new way. I'm not like a, I'm not an adventure dude. I'm a photographer who, who flies. I'm not a, a pilot who takes pictures. Um, and I just, I, I fell in love with this kind of flying because it let me, it let me see the world in new ways. And I was able to photograph parts of uh, remote deserts that had never really been seen from above before. And from above, you could see their, kind of how they work, their geography. I studied geophysics at Stanford. And for me, this was like, um, flying over the desert was kind of like graduate school. I could just, I could really explore and, and communicate um, the, these uh, really beautiful desert landforms. Anyway, so I, I photographed deserts. I got kind of obsessed with deserts. That was my last obsession. And I spent uh, 17 years photographing every freaking desert in the world. And um, I, um, I got, a, I got a, in Iran, I got detained three times for being a spy. Um, I snuck into Libya with my aircraft. When Gaddafi was in power and went back again after he was gone. But I was able to, to, to go and see unique places in, in a unique way. And my editor at the Geographic, after I finished all, seeing all the sand, he, he thought it might be interesting for me to look at some green. And he, he wanted me to work in this story that they were calling Feeding 9 Billion. Now, if you did, it would be Feeding 10 Billion because the, the, the population projections were um, a little too conservative. Anyway, and so he asked me to photograph the story. And I said, well, you know, Farming would be interesting from the air, but it'd really only be interesting if you looked at like the mega farms. Like, you know, a, a zebra under a tree is kind of boring, but you get 10,000 zebra together, that gets kind of interesting. So I proposed looking at mega farms, and I thought that would also help communicate the challenge of feeding 10 billion. So um, he, he agreed to my notion, and so uh, he gave me a list of places to go, but, and I developed my own ideas as well. And um, I decided to go to three places. I wanted to go around the United States because in the US we have the most industrialized uh, farming systems. And I wanted to go to Brazil because it has the fast, most rapidly expanding farm systems. And I wanted to go to China because China's become the world's biggest importer of food and they also have, temporarily, temporarily they have the world's largest population. They're about to be eclipsed by India. Um, so I decided to go to those three places. And the first place he sent me um, was, was Kansas to look at, at dry land farming, dry, uh, wheat farming. And this is the, uh, the Volgamore family farm. Uh, Brian Volgamore is the most successful farmer in Scott County, Kansas. And he's, um, Brian went to KU and he, he studied agronomy and he, he approaches farming like a scientist. He has his, a small plane which he uses to, to survey when his fields are ripe. And he has a fleet of six combines to harvest them. Each one has a GPS, GPS on board to record real time the yield in each square meter as he's harvesting. And he compares that to his soil maps, his, his rain records, the seed type, the planting methods, and the fertilizer he applied. And he's kind of running this like a continuous experiment. He, he's become so damn efficient at farming that almost all of his neighbors decided to let Brian farm their land for him because they, he can make more money out of it than they can. So one afternoon, Brian lent me his plane and his pilot to do some poking around southwest Kansas. 
And uh, we, he took me around and we came across a lot of feedlots in that area. And I became fascinated by this particular feedlot because it had a lot of a white discarded dairy cows and they stood out against the manure of the ground. I also, I like the, the big crop circle in the background because it's very dry there and they, they, there's a deep aquifer, the Ogallala Aquifer, and they pump the water up and they're able to irrigate the land to feed the cows. So I thought, oh, I can see this little ecosystem. But I was, I was frustrated flying around in the plane because it was too fast and it had this little window and I like a lawn chair. So a couple of days later, I went back with my lawn chair and um, I took off uh, from uh, an edge of a crop circle and, um, and I was flying around, it was at sunrise and I was looking at all the cows trying not to disturb them. And my flight assistant came on the radio and he said, George, the guy who runs the feedlot, he's here and he's kind of upset and he wants you to come and land and talk to him. And I said, well, look, I'm, I'm, I'm flying, I can't. I'll, I'll talk to him about half an hour when I land. He goes, no, he wants you right now. And I said, well, I'm sorry, I'm just not gonna do that. I'm taking pictures and tell him I'm working for the geographic and I, I blah, blah. And he says, well, he want, if he doesn't come, you don't come right down right now, he's gonna call the sheriff. I said, well, it's a free country. He wants to call the sheriff, call the sheriff. <laughs> so this is me about two hours later. <laughs> And, and um, I, when I landed, I showed the deputy, I showed him my, my Nat Geo ID, I explained what I was doing. Um, I'm a licensed paraglider pilot, airspace is free, and, and um, he confiscated my cameras, my car, and, and, threw, and threw me in jail. And he, he handcuffed me in the squad car, he seat, seat belted me in with my hands behind my back, and I asked him what this was all about, and he goes, well son, we're, we're, we're concerned about agro security. The agro security, I was about my own security, I was about crashing in that feedlot and getting trampled by the cows. And it just started making, you know, I, I went out there with like no ill intent, I wasn't looking for dead cows, I was just trying to see how these agricultural systems worked. And it just dawned on me that there are certain parts of our, of our food supply that people don't want us to see. And when you're a journalist and you ask somebody a question, they get all nervous, well, that's your story. And so I thought, hmm, I need to look at this more closely. And so as I started my tour around the world, or at least three parts of the world, I started looking a little more uh, intently. Um, this is the, um, my next place I went was the Amazon, and this is the Amazon on fire um, in Mato Grosso province. And this area is being rapidly cleared for, uh, mostly for, for soybean fields. Um, and in the morning, the, 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 the smoke kind of hangs down uh, low like a, like a cloud in the, in the trees. Um, if you went a little bit further to the north, you'd see where they're clearing the Amazon uh, for cattle ranches and clear cutting it. And um, clearly it's not a very sustainable practice, um, but the, it's very difficult to make a living out of, a, out of a intact forest. And so it's being rapidly cleared, it's very sad. Um, and in the same area, there are a lot of, some areas with a lot of um, Brazil nut trees. Those are the last trees standing in the cornfields. And they, by law, they have to leave a little barrier along the rivers uh, to act as a filter so they don't get nitrates and such into the water. And so all you see left of the Amazon are the Brazil nut trees and these little little patches of forest. And the Brazil nut trees don't live very long because there's no ecosystem left to support them. Um, and uh, this, is, this looks like a, a little patch of forest. This is actually a, a barrier along a tributary of the Amazon and they're harvesting soybeans. Um, I've been down there numerous times. I find the Am Brazil is fascinating for agriculture um, because they're, you know, in the U.S., you go out to the, to the Midwest and you find these kind of like little dying farm towns as the farms get bigger and bigger. They, they like Brian Volgamore, these big machines. They don't need so many people. In the Amazon, they're starting, in, they're starting in the late 20th century. So when they come in, they'll have, I mean, the farm sizes I was seeing, I was down there last month, they're averaging about 100 square miles. They're just massive. Um, and when they harvest, they get serious. And they had uh, yeah, 30,000 hectares, about 100 square miles. And the company that, that owns this, they have about two dozen of these farms. They're the biggest soybean exporter in the world. When we had a, a trade war with China under President Trump, you know, that, was the, that was the gold mine for the Brazilians because all of a sudden the, you know, they had a much more exclusive relationship with the Chinese. And they're exploiting that relationship um, very uh, wisely, to be honest. Um, this is the, um, the biggest soybean. This is a port in China near Shanghai that's exclusively for soybeans. Um, and they use it mostly for, they, they create soy sauce and soy products, but a lot of it is being used for, to feed pigs. Um, this is the biggest pig slaughterhouse in the world. There were 1,200 employees on the cutting room floor. They had a, a, a triple kill line. And the efficiency of this place was just, it was staggering. Um, 
It's also really amazing they let me photograph in there. And um, it, I've, had, I've been trying for years to get into a U.S. slaughterhouse, and they won't let me in, which I find kind of curious. Um, um, and the Chinese have gone through a lot of issues with food security, and so they're trying to centralize their facilities so they're easier to control. But um, there are still a few uh, weak spots in the food chain. This is after it leaves the slaughterhouse. They have to distribute it through town. And it was raining outside. This guy was riding through traffic with his motorbike and taking it to the local butcher shop. Um, and uh, in, in China, there are, um, the, the tastes are changing very rapidly. This was kind of a, uh, a rooftop yuppie kind of bar in Shanghai. People are trying out new kinds of food and sharing it on social media. Um, but they're eating a lot more, a lot more Western food, but not, not like, not like hamburgers per se. I mean, you can go to Pizza Hut in, in Beijing, but there, it's more Chinese food made with just more protein. And like you go to, uh, I went to a wedding parlor, and they had 12 courses of food. Each one was a protein course. There was not like a vegetable course. So there, um, there's a huge, and it's not just China. You find this throughout the developing world. Um, uh, there are also in China a big trend is moving towards uh, convenience foods. And this is a, a dumpling factory, because with two parents working, they don't have time to make the dumplings at home. Um, um, this is a, um, a crayfish festival. And 10,000 people showed up to eat crayfish. They emptied out an entire lake in one afternoon. In Brazil, they're having, um, they, they have some transportation issues in, in the Amazon. And so they started converting their soybeans into pork and then exporting the pork because you know you can have three you get three trucks of soybeans or one truck of pork chops and you let more money for the pork chops so this is just one pig farm it's the biggest pig farm in brazil um those little things in the lower right corner those are the bubbles for the biodigesters for all the uh, all the pig manure and you can see they have their own little ecosystem going there too they have their crop circles to uh, to grow uh, soybeans for the pigs um, this is inside one of the piggeries and this is a European standard uh, pig farm. I got in a, a couple of these in the United States. They're very tough to get you, but the, this, was, this is pretty, uh, pretty standard. And except this is European style. So in, in the European system, um, the pigs are required to have a certain amount of time where they're able to walk around freely. And some of the American, I, my understanding is in American pig farms, that's not always the case. Um, this is uh, one of the larger um, chicken farms. This is, raising, this is for raising fertile chicken eggs. Uh, to, to feed broiler farms. And they cut that first, they <laughs> cleared the Amazon, they realized no, no, they kind of wanted the trees because the trees act as a filter to, t to t take out airborne pathogens. So they planted artificial forest around all the chicken houses. And when I went there, we had, I had to get, I had to take a shower, get into a bunny suit. We had to, they had, they washed, the, we had to go through a, a cattle dip with the car to clean off the tires. The biosecurity here was really serious. Um, it was very impressive. Um, and then you go inside. This is the, um, uh, the, uh, one of the, the laying rooms. This is a, actually a different chicken farm. This one had, they had 4 million chickens. They grew, raised 2.7 million eggs per day. And they never touched a human hand. Everything was on conveyor belts. Um, in Brazil, it's tropical weather, so they don't have to have any walls in chicken houses. Um, and uh, they, I was lucky because they had the roof off the conveyor belts when I was there. I got lucky. Um, and uh, again, they're in, the, in Mato Grosso, they're exporting a lot of the poultry because it's cheaper to, they get, the uh, transportation's a problem, the road network is really, is really poor, and so they'll, they'll uh, export the, the protein instead of soybeans as chickens, and they'll send different parts to different parts of the world, like, you know, the heads and the feet will go to China, and the thighs will go to, you know, to, to France, and they've got it all figured out where the best price point is in the world. Very, very smart. Um, they say you are what you eat. This is inside the cafeteria of the chicken slaughterhouse. Um, this is the, uh, the largest chicken farm in, in China. This is outside of Beijing. And I wanted to go inside, but it, they would have, I would have had to spend three days in, a, in quarantine to go inside the chicken house. So I ended up photographing it through the window. And they use robots there to try and minimize human contact with the chickens to avoid pathogens. And it, it, again, it's all done by, um, they, the, though you see the robot in the back there, and the robot goes up and down the rows looking for um, objects that are cold and not moving, i.e. a dead chicken. And then they'll dispatch somebody to go and fetch the dead, dead chicken out of there. And she was trying to reprogram the robot so it worked properly. But they're really, they're, very, they're really smart about trying to, if you don't have people in there, they don't have problems. Uh, this is one of the largest chicken slaughterhouses in China. They supplied. Um, KFC and Pizza Hut and a bunch of other restaurants, mostly fast food. 
And it was like, kind of like a big slider. I was just super efficient. Um, in China, they've got a lot of issues with, uh, with land use. I mean, China, if you think about it, it's about the same size as the United States, except they don't have a west coast. They've got, like, they, they back onto Asia, so they don't have the, you know, the, 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 the uh, prodigious food output of California. And, and a lot of it's desert in the Himalaya. And so um, they've got, you know, like four times our population, but a small fraction of our arable land. And even the land that is arable, a lot of it is very difficult to farm, like this area in the Los Plateau. And they've, these were, they, they, put it, they cut in terraces with bulldozers. But to farm here, you, you know, it's very difficult to get uh, harvesting machines in there. It's mostly done by hand. And they also have a problem with a lot of the kids now. They go to school, and they don't want to come back and work on the farm, because farming is, especially by hand, is very difficult work. And so you have most of the farms I, I encountered was, was aging farmers and their kids who left to, to the city. They all wanted to work at the iPhone factory. Um, and even in you know kind of areas near closer to urban centers, um, I was finding that farmland was being taken out by new housing developments. These are these are uh, upper class Chinese housing developments, and to try to get the most out of the land, they covered it all in greenhouses. It's outside of Kunming, and they they were growing. This is in the south of China. It was kind of like you know they're like Georgia, and they were in the winter they'd be air freighting these vegetables up to the north so they could have uh, fresh produce in the winter. Um, and even in the uh, the warmer parts of China, they're losing a lot of uh, farmland to high rises. Um, this farmer had already, this guy's with the watering cans, he already lost his land for, a ro for road construction, and he was temporarily farming this land before they built more high rises on it. Um, so there, that's, this is one of the reasons why China has become, rapidly become the biggest food importer in the world. They have this you know, rising demand and, and shrinking ability to produce food. They're no longer self-sufficient. Um, I find it really interesting as I've gone on the world to, to look at different styles of creating the same product. Originally, I felt like I'd go to like, you know, the biggest sugar producer, and it's like, okay, I tick that box. And I realized, no, it's actually interesting to look at how the same commodity or the same food, maybe not a commodity, but it is made in different systems. And uh, this is one of the largest sugar plantations in Brazil. So it's also about 100 square miles for this one plantation. Um, all you know, uh, very uh, well-designed monoculture. I'm not advocating monoculture, but these guys have, have got it down. Um, and this is the sugar plant. And that big tongue you see, that's what they call bagasse. The bagasse is the, um, I should walk with the microphone. Bagasse is the, 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 the pulp that you get after you crush the cane. And they burn that for fuel. This, this, this sugar plantation actually uh, puts carbon back into the soil because they what they do with their bagasse, and they put, actually put energy back into the Brazilian grid, and they produce a lot of ethanol as well. So environmentally, this is far from the Amazon, and these guys are actually quite progressive. Um, and after being at the, at, you'll, um, after being at this, at this farm, I wanted to go and look at a, at a corollary in India. In India, it, for most Indians, it's illegal to own more than 10 hectares of land. That's 10 hectares, that's about 25 acres, and that's unirrigated. If it's irrigated land, you're only allowed five hectares. These are called, they're called land sealing laws. It's a leftover from the decolonization period. And uh, so in India, when they want to make sugar, this is the ingest yard. And this, uh, they had 60,000 farmers who were providing cane for this one factory. And this is about the same size as the one you saw in Brazil. But they, by law, they had to source it from all these little farmers. So every guy has, every farmer has a, a phone with a little app on it, and they can see what their delivery date is, and they show up with their tractor. And these guys are really nice. I wanted to photograph the thing full, and they were so efficient that the parking lot was never full. So they, <laughs> really nice. they stopped the factory for me for about six hours, and these guys are all getting really upset, so I got them all to stand in front and have the picture taken. But, but this, is, this, is a, you know, this is about a half a morning's worth of, of tractors, and so these guys are a two-month period, and every guy has his day to come in and drop off his tractor full from his little farm. And this is the ingest for the farm. They also bring some stuff in. It's consolidated, not from the farms that are far away. They bring it in by truck, and they tip the truck to unload the, uh, the cane. Um, and this is uh, rice in, in Yunnan province in China. Um, you, uh, this area of Yunnan, is the, these are the biggest rice terraces in the world. They're over uh, 3,000 feet of vertical, and they're all carved by hand, and it's like this cascade of water going down the mountain. Um, and, but even this area is having a hard time. It's a, it's a World Heritage Site for agriculture, but they're having a hard time maintaining their fields because the kids don't want to do it anymore. And so they actually have to start paying. There's, there's, a, there's a, because it's UNESCO World Heritage Site, there's a, a photo lookout and make a lot of money selling tchotchkes. And so they're actually paying people now to farm all these terraces so that they can keep them as a photo op. 
kind of agro-tourism. This is actually, this is the uh, group of ladies who are actually being paid to, to plant rice in the rice terraces. Um, so this rice in China, in India, which is almost the same population, they have lots of small farmers and it's a much more chaotic scene. This is um, one of the markets in India. The, the prices are all controlled by the government and the government also provides subsidized food uh, to the poor. Um, and it's, uh, it's a very complicated network, but it's, it's very difficult for the farmers here to make a living. If you look at India by population, about 60% of the Indians are small scale farmers, but they only make about like 25 of the GDP. And so they're all kind of low wage farmers. They're all struggling and complaining. Um, and you go into, the, these, and they're bringing, during, in that same market, they bring in uh, out of state workers from poor states to, to help with the harvest work or help with the, the, the winnowing. And uh, the men do all the heavy work, and the women, they, they look for the scraps and they sell that. They're going through all the, the chaff trying to find little bits that they can, they can eat or sell for their families. Um, the same guy who owned that big sugar plant in Brazil, he said, oh, George, you want to see a big farmer? You should come to our cattle farm. We've got 100 square miles of cattle and 30,000 cows. And this is Marco's farm. This was taken uh, about three weeks ago in Mato Grosso. And in Brazil, most of the, um, they don't do um, feedlot beef. The, the, for export, they do feedlot beef, but the domestic market, it's, it's poor, and so it's, um, it's free-range cattle. Um, this is the slaughterhouse. This is the JBS slaughterhouse. It's the largest one in Latin America. Um, and these are all white. These white cattle are it's a breed called Nilori. It's an Indian breed that does really well in the tropics. Um, this is the largest, or one of the largest feedlots in the United States. This is in, um, in, in Idaho. And this was started by um, a guy named Jack Simplot. He's a billionaire, or was a billionaire. He died a few years ago. And, and Jack, um, he, he, he grew all the French fries for McDonald's, and he had all this French fry waste, potato waste, and he realized he could feed it to cattle. And there's a lot of dairy cows in, in, um, in this part of Idaho. And so he started using it as, as, as feedlot, as, as the, the potato waste as, as cattle feed, and he's got over 100, I think it was 150,000 cows he had the day I flew over it. Um, this is uh, one of the biggest beef processors in the United States. This is a Tyson's uh, facility near Amarillo. Um, I also wanted to look at um, differences in production with, with coffee, and uh, this is a, a large Brazilian coffee farm. G typically, coffee is a shade plant, but the Brazilians plant in an area just at the edge of the tropics where they can raise coffee without shade, and they can machine harvest. They have this machine that drives over it, kind of like, um, it's kind of like two really long arms, and they see these fingers that go through it. It looks kind of like a car wash, and it rips all the berries off. Um, and almost every other country in the world that we get coffee, they have to pick it by hand, but Brazil, because of where they're planting and their methods of, of production, they have now 40% of the coffee market. This is one of their uh, techno coffee processing facilities. Uh, but coffee actually, it began in Ethiopia, originally in Ethiopia centuries, thousands of years ago, and this is one of the largest coffee processors in Ethiopia, where the workers all make $3 a day. And they're very happy. This, actually, the, the typical wage there is $2 a day. They're all really happy to show up for 3 bucks a day. And it's all done by hand. You see this is the washing station. So compared to like, you know, Brazil where it's all techno, techno, and then here it's all manual, manual. Um, and the drying, instead of going through a dry, drying machine, they have these big racks and the ladies cover them up at night and they unwrap them in the morning and they spread them all out to dry. And then instead of going through a machine, like with a laser to look for all the flawed beans, they do it all by hand. So when you go to Starbucks, what do you do? Do you order Ethiopian or Brazilian? I don't know. I, I, I order the one that takes best, but. Um, California is the world's biggest almond producer. Um, this is um, during the, the height of the floration, and um, they have, I think, something like three quarters of the commercial honeybees in the United States are in California for the almond harvest to pollinate all those, all those flowers. But every almond you consume requires a gallon of irrigation water, and as a native Californian, that's a problem. Um, this is cashew production in India. Virtually most of the cashews are grown in Africa, but they all come to India because of the, the cheap labor, and these ladies are really good with their hands. And they're all, every, virtually every cashew I ever had was opened by hand by a lady in a factory like this, so sitting on the ground. 
Um, a couple years ago, somebody figured out a machine that lets you machine crunch them, and now most of the businesses moved to Vietnam where they have the machines, and these, this is the last uh, Indian hand cracking factory. This was taken about two years ago. Um, I also found it really interesting looking at comparative dairy operations. This is the largest dairy in the world. Um, this is in China. They had, I think, 35,000 cows at this one dairy. Um, they had eight rotary milkers in this one facility, and they went from cow all the way to yogurt in the same building. The efficiency was just phenomenal. I was told they're building a new dairy for 85,000 cows um, to feed the Russian market, because after the Russian shot down, that was that, that plane over Ukraine like a couple of years ago, the Russians said they couldn't buy any more Dutch cheese, and so they decided to source all that. They made a deal with the Chinese to put in a new dairy. Um, this is the, one of the largest, one of the, the second largest, second, second or third largest dairy company in the United States um, called Milk Source in Wisconsin. And they have one farm for all of their, uh, all of their, their, their young female calves as they're getting old enough to be reintroduced to the dairy system. And um, that truck you see in the top, that's the, the water truck. They had a couple of vets on staff and every cow, you guys probably, in, is your, your farm area, but for young cows, you put them in these little hutches so that they have a little shelter and they have a little yard to go outside. But the, by dividing them up like this, they prevent the, the spread of communicable diseases between the cows. And as a corollary, this is the Banas dairy in, China, in India. This is the largest dairy in the world. This dairy produces 7 million liters a day. They have 450,000 members of their co-op, and every co-op member has an average six cows, two of them in milk. And they're all milked by hand. People line up to take their milk to the distribution center. They're scattered throughout the villages. They had 350 trucks that carry the milk to the dairy, and they put the dairy, the milk onto a milk train, and it goes to Delhi. Um, and what's really amazing about, about Banas is if you go to the store, like 80% of the price that you pay for milk in the store goes to the individual farmer in the co-op. Is it super efficient? Um, it's really phenomenal. And they also had, they have a, a gas station from, from their biodigester. They pay their farmers uh, a couple of rupees for every kilo of manure. They pick up the manure, they deliver it to the biodigester, and they compress the methane that comes off it, and they sell it as a gas station. Really innovative. And it's all, it's a co-op. Um, this, this is what they, they, they got genetic improvement facility. <laughs> and um, the, the, they were trying to improve the productivity of the Indian cows. This, this, is, this cow, this uh, Holston from, from the Netherlands is actually mounting a buffalo, but she's, the, the, I don't want to go into too much detail. But anyway, <laughs> the, the, they were trying to improve the, the breed and, and they've, they've had, I can't remember the exact statistic, but over the past like 10 years, they've almost doubled the productivity of their cattle by crossbreeding uh, with, with, uh, with Holstons. But if they have it all Holstons, they, they can't survive in that climate. So they're trying to figure out exactly the right, the right blend. And I think you know, one of the big solutions to feeding 10 billion is actually improving genetics. Um, this is in, uh, in Peru. And that little thing you see in your right, um, that's a corn cob that was left in the ground 6,500 years ago is the first agricultural site in South America, and I went to the local market and got the corn they're selling there today, and that's a lot of genetic improvement. <laughs> and you know, this was all, that's all done, this is all you know, pre-GMO stuff, um, but I think now with the, with the modern tools, um, it, it's really exciting. I think that's, that's how we're gonna be able to, to, to meet increasing demand. Um, this is a genetic research uh, facility in, in Germany, formerly East Germany, and these are all ancient plants that don't propagate by seed, little creepers, like, you know, like um, little, little vine creepery plants. And these are ancient food plants, and they're trying to keep them alive, but they're trying to keep them separate, to keep their genetics separate, and they crossbreed them, trying to get the most uh, productive and useful plants. And they were working with wheat when I was there, and this is an ancient uh, form of wheat they collected about 100 years ago in Romania. It's a, a three-headed wheat, and it's such a heavy head that it falls over in the ground, but they're trying to crossbreed that with something with a stronger stem so it doesn't go over in the wind. Um, and try to make, you know, make, try to make our, our fields more productive. Uh, this is in Washington State, where they were, um, these are all different ascensions of wheat. They're in, in the Palouse, which is the most productive wheat country in the US. And there are, this is not uh, uh, genetic modification, it's just standard crossbreeding, but they're trying to get the, the, the most productive and also the, the ones with the best millability, the best flavor, the most nutrition, and uh, trying to get the most out of our land. And to me, you know, one of the, to me, one of the goals 
I think that we should have it in food systems is try to get the most of the land we have in the ground so we can protect the existing wild spaces. And I see genetics is, is really the key to that, um, that and other you know, advances in farming practice. Um, this is um, hydroponic agriculture in the Netherlands, uh, mostly for tomatoes, but the, the, the pink uh, light was for uh, growing um, green, microgreens that they use at high-end restaurants for chefs. But in the Netherlands, they have really, in the winter, um, you can't really grow very much, so they have artificial light in the winter months to extend their growing season. Um, and uh, this is one of the largest tomato farms in the Netherlands. They, they started off growing these hydroponically. People used to jokingly call them water bombs because they had no, they were like red water bombs that had no flavor. But they actually, they're really quite tasty. And you find a lot of these are, they're, they're expanding in the United States now too, the same systems. The Dutch are really the pioneers of this. I mean, the, the Dutch are the, um, United States is the biggest food exporter in the world. Number two, the Netherlands. These guys are really good. Um, and part of it's because it's all like, you know, they're in a really small country, so they send it to Belgium, it counts as an export. But, um, you know, if you look at it that way, maybe California would be the biggest in the world. But, but still, the Dutch are very, very, very impressive gardeners. Um, uh, this is in, uh, in, in Japan, where they, after the uh, nuclear disaster at Fukushima, they want to have local food. And so they developed this rotary, um, a rotary hydroponic system, and they plant the baby, the little baby spinach and, and lettuce in the center. And it turns once a day, and it's all it's floating on a, on a bath of nutrients. And after 30 days, it gets to the outside, and they pick it and send it to market. And it's quite tasty. I mean, I, I personally am not that keen on some of this techno food, because I, I feel like I'd rather have something coming out of the ground. But stuff. Tastes pretty good. Um, this is in Newark. I live in New Jersey and local food. Um, this is one of the biggest vertical farms in New Jersey. Um, my understanding is uh, that they're not really making any money, but it's a, it's a, it's a proof of concept, and it could use a hell of a lot of electricity. Um, but they're growing uh, local vegetables in, in an old factory in Newark. And one of the biggest problems is that they is air circulation, because we have that much uh, that many LEDs in a building, you get a lot of heat and humidity building up, and they kind of kind of moldy stuff in the bottom and dry stuff in the bottom, and the air handling is really complicated. So I don't think the technology is quite there for this kind of stuff, let alone the just the sheer energy cost of this kind of food. It's a little bit, I think it's a little bit ambitious. This is actually how they do it. This is called aeroponics, and so they, they plant the seeds on a little mat. It looks like astroturf, and the roots dangle down because they have a spray of nutrients coming from down below. Um, the glow of lights is courtesy of George Steinmetz, but um, <laughs> but it's it's a really it's a really interesting te technique. But I, I just don't I don't my sense was the economics are not are not quite there yet. Um, this is the biggest uh, carrot producer in the world. Uh, this is Grimway Farms in California. They pioneered those you know those little baby lo bunny love carrots, those little stubbies. They, they, they didn't figure it out, but they they bought the guy who figured it out. And what they figured out was that you want to get a skinny little carrot, it's about nine inches long, cut it three pieces, and they put it, they would let me put it off the room, but they, they have this top secret kind of thing, it looked like a clothes dryer that takes the skin off. And so there's convenience carrots, convenience food, just like in China with the, you know, the dumpling factory, well, the convenience food is great because people don't want to spend all this time like peeling carrots. I used to hate how my mom had me peel the carrots and cut my fingers. Well, now you get bunny love, and anyway, these guys are, are, are crushing the market with their skinny little carrots. Um, <laughs> And it's also interesting, um, you know, I, the, I was talking to the guy, who, the, their head, head of production, and he, he said they, they, do, they do organic carrots, too. And he said, you know, we, make, we like organic because we make more money out of it. Um, but he said, you know, we use twice as much land, twice as much water for organic product. Because they, in California, they have to irrigate. When they have to, the, uh, carrots take a lot of nutrients out of the soil, so they, have to, they, have to, um, they can't plant every year. They have to put a cover crop in between years. And they have to irrigate the cover crops, so they're looking at twice as much land, twice as much water. And so, I, I personally, I know it's kind of a dangerous thing to say, but I'm concerned about organic. Everything's organic is a solution, but if you use twice as much land, twice as much water to feed 10 billion people, I don't see how we're going to get there. I, I don't really know if that's going to work, but that's my two cents. Um, I shouldn't say opinions. I'm a journalist, but I don't see how we're going to get there. Um, this is the biggest organic lettuce grower in California. Um, uh, earthbound farms, when you buy the, they sell it in those little clamshells, and they have these laser, laser uh, laid out fields, and they cut early in the morning so the lettuce doesn't wilt, and they have a machine, it looks kind of like a Zamboni, it cut the, you know, the, at the ice rink, and it cuts the, cuts the lettuce off about a half inch above the ground, and they have the, uh, these uh, Mexican laborers to go out in, in front with flashlights to make sure they don't get any rabbits in there. Um, but it was, um, 
really technical. Um, and uh, this was the, um, the biggest, um, pardon? Is that a question? Um, this is the biggest lettuce grower in California. These guys are um, Taylor Farms. And these guys really had their agronomics down because they plant like eight different kinds of lettuce and they can harvest it. It all, it all ripens at exactly the same time. And they box it in the field and it goes straight from farm to market, direct. I mean, the, the box you see are the same ones you would find at, you know, Costco or your Giant or whatever. Um, but to get them all to harvest exactly at the same time is, is really tricky. And these guys have really got it, they got it down. Um, and this is a crop research in, at the University of Arizona. They were working with a, this is a, a robotic scanalyzer. It does a, basically creates a three-dimensional uh, laser scan of the entire field. Here they're doing sunflowers. Um, and it was, when I took this picture, it was 110. And they're trying to look at heat tolerance and drought tolerance to make um, crops that will thrive in more, the hotter and more radical environment that we're getting as the climate changes. Really impressive work. Um, and this is in, uh, sometimes you, you find solutions in, I mean, all these solutions to me are not just in, in, in you know, the techno-American world. This is in, in India, uh, where the Tata group was working on a, a coffee plantation. If you look closely, you see those, the, the, the undergrowth is white, and that's all coffee. Coffee is, outside of Brazil, it's a shade plant. And they're growing peppers on the shade trees, and this is harvesting the peppers. And they have these guys got these poles with little, little steps on them, and um, they were harvesting black pepper. So they get, they were, they were dual cropping, really creative. And this is actually tiger and elephant habitat too. So they were doing it, protecting the forest, protecting wildlife, and getting two crops out of one. They were, it wasn't super productive in terms of like yield per acre, but they were doing it. It was impressive to me. Um, and the biggest tractor manufacturer in the world, it's not John Deere, it's Mahindra in China. And you can get your tractor in any color you want as long as it's red. And they're all little, they're all little simple little things. No, you know, no awning, no GPS, no, no disco system. But it's a really simple tractor. And their, their idea is to democratize farming, to kind of like power to the little people. And uh, in India, there are a lot of little people to power to. So they're doing well. Um, this is in Pennsylvania. This is the, um, the Rodale, uh, Rodale Institute's experimental farm. And this is just outside J.I. Rodale's house. And they don't use this anymore, but he had this idea like he wanted to make these soil profiles, like, you know, organic soil, and you, could, you do different soil experiments. So he built silos in the ground so to protect the soil, and they had different experiments he would do to see, to, to try and build up the soil. And now it's used as flower beds outside his house, but I thought it was kind of cool. <laughs> and here in Lancaster, I came down here because I wanted to look at, uh, I saw a little statistic somewhere that Lancaster County is the most productive non-irrigated farmland in the United States. That's, that's pretty interesting. I want to go down and see what those guys are doing. So I came down here this time last year. I started poking around. And this is a conventional farm. Uh, not, it's near, near Kinzer's. Um, and right on the left is an Amish farm. And this is them harvesting. And I just find it really fascinating. The, 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 I mean, you guys probably know this because it's your area, and I feel kind of, it's kind of dangerous coming as the out-of-towner coming in and telling you about your own thing. But I, 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 I find it really interesting. The, 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 most of the Amish farmers that I met were using conventional systems. They were using like GMO crops and, 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 and fertilizer, but it was all 19th century technology in terms of the machines and farm animals with a little bit of help. They have like a baling machine in the back. Um, and it was, it was really difficult getting access to take pictures, but I found with the drone it was a little easier because it wasn't like a person, it was the drone taking the picture. And, and I could like, show their wife the screen while they, I was like a mile away, and they're, they're pretty nice. They let me, you know, I, mean, I took a lot of persistence, and one of my drones ended up in a tree, and he charged me $1,000 to get out of the tree for the tree picker, but I got my picture. <laughs> you do what you gotta do. Um, and uh, this is uh, right nearby, I, I found it really interesting like how you know, in, in Amish country, how the small-scale farmers were trying to make a go of it, and they were raising um, uh, free-range uh, or pasture-raised chickens, and they had to move these coops every day, and they had the dog out there keeping the foxes away, and it was a really nice way for a small family farm to make a go of it, and because of where they are, they can sell uh, these things for, these eggs for lots of money in, in urban areas like Pennsylvania and New York. And um, so I think, I think this might be my last photo. Yes, that's not my last photo, that's somebody else's. So anyway, uh, this is a small crowd. One of the things I love about being with the small crowd is I can take questions. So does anybody have any questions? No questions? You're letting me off easy. Yes, in the back. So what you were mentioning, just the soil issues around the 
around the world. Because I've heard reports at the end of one of the biggest drug actions is depletion of soil. Is depletion of soil? Yeah. It's a huge issue. Yeah. I mean, the good news is I think soil can recover if you, if you do the right things. Um, but it's, I mean, people are short-sighted and, um, yeah, it's a problem. I mean, and I don't know if, you know, the, 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 I was thinking about going to forever. This, this is the right time of year to go to Madagascar to look at the runoff, but it's, it's a problem all over. And uh, it's just, it's very, it's very challenging for me to photograph it. Um, it's easier to photograph what's working is, or something working than something that's not working. But it's, um, it's a huge issue in, uh, all over the world. I don't, think, I, don't, I don't think anybody is a particular, you know, bad guy. But it's a big problem. Yes? Is there anything that you stop eating as a result of your work? <laughs> well, I, I, you know, it's funny. Like, I, you know, I, after I go to the like, pork factory, I, don't, I didn't order ribs that night. Um, but <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm not, a, I'm not a, a vegan or vegetarian. And I, actually, I, I, I'm 64 now. And I started gaining weight like about a few years ago. I didn't like it. So a few months ago, my kids all are on college now, so I can eat what I want. I'm not like I got all the Oreos out of the house and stuff. Um, and so I'm on a new diet now. It's, kind of, it's not a fad, but I, just, I don't eat um, carbohydrates. And it's, I've lost about 20 pounds in the past three months because I'm just eating protein. And I don't really care if it's shrimp or beef or chicken or, or salmon or whatever, but protein and salad. And, and, but that's more, it's more for me for my diet rather than ethically. Um, I do personally. Um, I mean, I'm not telling people what to do. And as a, as a journalist, I feel like my, my job is just to go out and record the information. And I'll go into the world's biggest slaughterhouse and I'll say, wow, like, how do you kill 10,000 cows a day? That's really cool. And I'll write down how they do it and I'll put that in the book. And I'll go talk to the organic guy who he's trying to do what he's trying to do. I just want to get his information and put it out there because I want people to be able to make their own decisions. I don't really think it's my job to tell you what to do. But you ask me personally what I do, like I, when I buy milk, I think about like the really mega dairy, like this monster dairy in China, or, or the, the really big ones in Wisconsin, where like you walk into the really mega dairies, and the cows are afraid of you, because they never see people. And you go into the organic dairy, and it's like, you know, the cows are like, oh. It's, it's, it's just, and I, they, they don't run away. And um, so I just feel like, when I buy, buy milk, I just feel like, I kind of, it's friendlier to the cows to, to buy the organic milk. I still drink milk, and dairies are, I mean, I don't know. They are what they are, but I, 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 I still buy the product, but I, I personally feel more comfortable buying organic. But if you want to buy conventional, go for it. It's all right. You know. Buy Ready Whip, go for it. It's all right. So, yes? Uh, what's next for you as a photographer? You know, it's a little off topic to science I don't know. You know, you don't really solve a. Yeah. I, I'm trying to finish food, and it's been. It's been kind of crazy because I've been doing this for like eight, nine years, and I realized I had to finish it because it's food's infinite, and and, um, and you can't do everything. And if you did everything by the time you finished it, it would, it would change. You have to go back because f- actually farming is very dynamic. The systems are changing rapidly. So I, I don't know. I think I'm, I'm going to try and finish within the next year, and um, I, I'm trying to get like th- there. I got a list, kind of a crazy shoot list. I want to go to. It's kind of weird. I want to go to Somaliland because they ship about a million goats to Saudi Arabia for the Hajj on the, on the third day of the pilgrimage. Every pilgrim's got to kill an animal. And so they have this goat rush, like a week where they ship out a million goats. And I want to go for the goat rush. So there's kind of these crazy situations, obscure things that nobody knows about. So I, I got a list of like things that I'm going to do in the next year um, to kind of fill in my, my, my checklist of all the weird stuff I found doing research. And after that, I don't know the next thing. I, just, I find it really interesting as a journalist to work on one concentrated thing, like I did 15 years, 17 years of deserts. I found some really weird stuff. And I wouldn't have found that stuff if I hadn't just focused on extreme deserts. And so I've been looking at mega food systems and I'm finding like, like the goats in, in, in you know, Somaliland. So I'm having a really good time doing that. But the next thing, I, I don't know. I, I, don't th- I think my, para, my paragliding days are kind of over. But the drones came along just in time. And so, um, but I, I don't know, I have to figure that out. I, I, I'm gonna fi- try to finish, I'm still kind of looking at the goal line instead of what's the next, you know, 15 year project. But, um, so I'm not, I didn't, I mean, I, I'm, I didn't grow up in food. I grew up in, in LA and I was not a foodie, but I just something I, I stumbled onto and I thought, wow, like first of all, I got kind of annoyed this guy was arresting me in Kansas. <laughs> but I just realized that, you know, in the United States, only one half percent of the people are involved in produ- food production. And so there's a huge disconnect between 
the consumer and the producer. And I think that's really a problem because I think our, our, our food decisions are really, I think they're, they're environmental decisions. And do you buy like organic or do you buy, and everybody thinks like, oh, I'll go organic. But it's like, actually organic is actually, it's a little more complicated. And, it, and it's like, organic might be one thing here, it might be a different thing there. It, it's really complicated. And, and if you buy, you know, or, organic from, the, from, if you buy one product, what, what did they feed that product? Where did the nutrients come from? What was, what are the methods? How was it transported? It's all really complicated. And so I'm trying to add more transparency to those decisions so people can be, make more informed decisions. But like, you know, when I showed some of these pictures of Mega Farm, I did a big project um, for the New York Times on Mega Farm. I showed this stuff to the New Yorkers, they're like, what? They, they just had no idea, because they're all in there. I mean, to me, to be honest, I mean, New York, it's kind of crazy. All these people link vertically. It's kind of like the, 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 the big CAFOs. It's like they're all in this like confined animal feeding operation. It's all, it's, you know, they're all in the vertical. It's, it's crazy how they live. I mean, to me, as a New Jersey guy. Um, but, <laughs> They, they, they look down at me, but it's just, you know, it's just, um, so I, I'm finding it really a fascinating thing to explore, and I, I feel like there's this huge disconnect, and if I can help have a little more dialogue between the two, and what's really satisfying to me is when I go and photograph a, a farm, and, you know, like the vegans think it's terrible, and, and the guy who does the dairy operation, like, yeah, that's great, that's how we do it, and I want to be, but then I played it up the middle, and that's what I try to do is just to show, you know, honest information so people can make their own choices. Yes. The pictures you showed there of the Amazon, um, how, how bad is it? Like, how far along is it so the Amazon has got kind of disappeared? Uh, well, the Amazon is really big. And it, it's, I mean, it's, and even how you define it is kind of complicated. If you look at it for the whole basin, there are parts of the Amazon that are not really even in the, they're, they're not really that tropical. It's because it's a huge, you know, it's like the Mississippi, you know, it's just, it's, it goes up to Montana, it's all, you know. So, I think in terms of, the, if you look at the Amazon Basin, I think maybe 20, 30% is gone. There's a lot left. But I just don't see a solution there. I, I, I don't see a way that, I, I'm not, it's, I find it really tragic and it's a really sad place to go. Um, and I find it really fascinating and important. But I don't, I haven't, I haven't seen a solution to preserving forests because preserved forest doesn't pay for itself. And I have people paying carbon credits, like who's taking the money for that? Who's protecting it? And it's just really complicated. So I haven't. I hope, I hope there's a solution, I just haven't seen it yet. We'll take uh, one more question, and then you'll have to join us afterwards. There's an after party, you just talk to George Moore. We'll drag him over. <laughs> yeah. Question. Yeah. So based off your research, are you optimistic about our ability to feed 10 billion people? Yes. You know, there's new, um, the same editor who, who gave me this food assignment, he's retired now. <laughs> um, but he, um, he gave me an assignment. He asked me, like, you know, 20 years ago, to a story about the about the called the end of cheap oil. And I studied geophysics at Stanford. I was I, I was trained to be like an exploration geophysicist to find oil. And I said, Dennis, you don't really understand oil. It's like you think it's like a tank in your car, and when we're out, we're out. And it's like it's no, it's not like that. It's like um, oil is like a it's like a sponge. The or, or it's like sponge, and the harder you squeeze it, the more you get out. And like we, everybody thought we were running at cheap oil, and then like fracking came along. All of a sudden, there's a hell of a lot more oil because there's new technology. And so, if you can find, you look at these guys with genetics, and, um, and and if they can develop new, you know, new planting methods, new uh, new varieties, new fertilizer methods, new. Um, I mean, I think anybody who bets against human potential is a fool. I mean, you look at you know what, what we developed over the past millennia as humans. I just I don't see I, I don't see us reaching a limit to human creativity. And, um, but I just think that there, there needs to be, I think people need to be more aware of their, of their choice, have more ac accurate information. So when you buy like, you know, Land O'Lakes butter and you see like the happy cow under the barn, that's just, that's not the reality. And, and, and I think we need to be more connected to, to our food sources and have more, more information. So. Thank you all for coming tonight.